So um, my name is Tony Fremont. I am a medically qualified molecular pathologist. And for a little over 40 years, I've been designing tests to improve patient outcomes based on recognizing the changes that occur to the molecular profiles in blood, urine and tissue in disease. Some years ago, with great foresight, Professor Rosalie David asked if I could bring the same sort of tests to understanding mummies. With funding of over a million pounds from private donors, our team has started to use the techniques applied to patients to understand better the people and peoples living along the Nile. And we've done this through the study of mummies. One of the mummies we studied is Takabuti. Our lecturer, Dr. Constantina Drossu, is one of the most skilled academics in the world at analyzing mummified tissues for ancient DNA. Uh, that is a forensically piecing together DNA signatures degraded by time. Constantina cannot be with us, so I'm presenting her findings about mitochondrial DNA in Takabuti. I will cover what mitochondrial DNA is, how Constantina is using this knowledge to investigate the early origins of the ancient Egyptians before focusing on her findings from Takabuti to understand better the person behind the mummy. There are four main groups of biomolecules, nucleic acids, proteins, fats, and sugars. Here we focus on one of the two different types of nucleic acids, deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA. Many of the diagrams that I'm using come from Wiki Commons, a public access website full of useful images. I acknowledge the source in the blueprint close to each image. When we think about DNA, I guess we all see in our mind's eye the template of life first described in detail by Franklin, Crick and Watson. This DNA is found in the nucleus of the cell and when activated produces RNA which in turn makes proteins the doing molecules of the cell. In the cut through model of a cell and in the adjacent electron micrograph, you can see that the nucleus dominates the cell. It is usually the largest single intracellular component or organelle. The cell also contains multiple smaller organelles called mitochondria. They generate power and energy to drive all the function of our cells. Scientists believe they had an interesting origin. Going back hundreds of millions of years to the origins of life on Earth, a step change in evolution occurred when a large bacterium-like cell ingested a smaller bacterium, which became uh, the larger cell's mitochondrion. Both of them found this situation mutually beneficial, a process known as symbiosis. And although they didn't know it at the time, this signaled the start of all complex life on Earth. One consequence is that mitochondria have much of the functionality of a cell, including their own DNA, passed on from cell to cell at the time of cell division. When compared with nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA differs in a number of key points. It's circular in structure, making it more resilient to damage. It is simpler, having fewer genes. It has a relatively rapid rate of evolutionary structural change. Whenever DNA unravels to build RNA or it replicates, it can end up with a slightly different molecular structure to the initial DNA. The key differences are called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. They aren't quite the same as mutations, but I have used that word for simplicity. Finally, and most important, because the ovum is a big cell and the sperm is virtually just a concentrated ball of genes, almost all of the mitochondria in the fertilized ovum come from the mother. Mitochondrial DNA is therefore passed from generation to generation through the matrilineal route. The diagram at the top right is important. It shows what happens when mitochondrial DNA mutations occur. A population of maternally linked individuals will have the same uh, mitochondrial DNA. This is shown by the blue circle mtDNA1. As part of the natural behavior of DNA, every now and again a SNP occurs. And so long as it is either non-harmful or beneficial, 
the individual in which the mutation occurred will survive. The individual will have a novel mitochondrial DNA, differing from the previous mitochondrial signature by a very small but detectable amount. Over time, further mutations occur so that more and more different forms of mitochondrial DNA are found in a population. Each one of these is known as a haplogroup. By spotting sequential mutations, it is possible to build an evolutionary tree for mitochondrial DNA. It follows that if you trace the mutations back as far as possible, you will find the very first haplogroup, the equivalent of the blue circles in our diagram. For Homo sapiens, this is colorfully known as mitochondrial Eve. Of course, if you know the rate that mutations occur in the mitochondrial genome, a process that is faster and more reproducible uh, in mitochondrial DNA than nuclear DNA, you can not only draw a tree, but give a time when each new haplogroup formed. If you suspect that changes in mitochondrial DNA not only occurred in time, but also in naturally migrating creatures like modern man in geographic space, you could follow population movements around the globe, or at least from place to place. This has been done for our species, Homo sapiens, leading to the development of this map. It shows how and when, after thousands of years of colonizing sub-Saharan Africa, Homo sapiens suddenly left Africa and progressively spread throughout the world. Remarkably, our oldest haplogroups, designated L, remained in sub-Saharan Africa. But as soon as the out of Africa event occurred, new mutations arose to form haplogroups M and N. Further progressive changes in haplogroups occurred with time as modern humans spread across the world. Tracking back in time and place to this out of Africa event suggests it occurred about 70,000 years ago when sapiens crossed the bottom of the Red Sea from modern day Djibouti to modern day Yemen. This is great, but it doesn't quite fit all the logic lines or archeological data. It causes us to ask some pointed questions. Why cross the Red Sea when you could go down the Nile? The Nile is a relatively easy route to traverse, the land on either side and the water rich in game and useful plants. Central to this out of Africa model is a poorly understood series of mutations leading to M and N haplogroups. But the lack of clarity about this period in mitochondrial DNA evolution gives rise to some inelegant hypotheses, which like everything that isn't simple and beautiful in biology, are less than convincing. It also relies on us using modern populations to determine where events occurred tens of thousands of years ago. And finally, we know that there are modern human fossils in Northwest Africa, Europe and Asia that are much older than can be explained by an event that occurred only 70,000 years ago. What is needed is real temporogeographic data to test this hypothesis. Constantina is addressing this problem by looking into the haplogroup groups of communities in the Nile Valley from the second and third millennia BCE. This gives real time and real geographic data and comes from the only place on Earth where you can answer the question, did humans really ignore the Nile when migrating from sub-Saharan Africa? Her findings about the origins of the ancient Egyptians and human migration are very exciting, but not the subject of today's talk. One of the mummies she haplogrouped was Takabuti. Takabuti has the very rare haplogroup called H4A1. In antiquity, it has only been found in the Belbika people skeletons from Central Europe and has not been described in Egyptian mummies before. In modern societies, it is found in the Southern Iberian Peninsula, Canary Islands and Lebanon, which are at the opposite ends of the Mediterranean at both ends of the maritime trade routes of the Phoenicians. The genetic data are immutable, 
but not their interpretation. This relies on archaeological and particular, particularly Egyptological context and understanding what the genetics is telling us. The story or biography of Takabuti has been developed through the multidisciplinary research you're hearing about today. How does the genetic data contribute to this? The genetics tell us that Takabuti does not have any of the predominant haplogroups found in ancient Egyptian mummies, and that she or her female ancestors very probably originated outside the Nile Valley. To my mind, that small piece of genetic information brings a new dimension to Takabuti's biography and invites a whole series of questions that might not have been asked had it not come to light. So here are a few examples of questions raised by the genetics. This woman, or more likely her female ancestors, were not from Egypt, but possibly from the eastern end of the Mediterranean. Knowing what we do about her and the culture of the Kushite 25th dynasty, is it known whether women who originated outside ancient Egypt in the Kushite dynasty entered and shaped Egyptian society? If yes, how did women enter society? Was it a consequence of war, trade, allegiance building, and or the possession of unique physical or intellectual skills? How easy was it for a woman with, say, a Eurasian background to integrate into 25th dynasty Egyptian society? And would this have been a difficult transition for her? And the corollary, how distinct was Egyptian society from neighboring cultures? And were there regional differences inside Egypt? Was the culture of Thebes different to that in the Delta? I'm really asking, was she or her mother or grandmother special? Or was their assimilation into society a normal occurrence? I hope I've shown you how genetic data can enrich a biographical investigation of an ancient person and hinted at how much wider questions around the origins of people might be addressed through genetic studies. I must end by thanking Constantina for allowing me to present her work, but I take full responsibility for the interpretation I have given in this talk. Thank you.